Hi, this is Dr. Jeff Klein, editor of Radiographics, and welcome to the Radiographics Audio Summary Podcast. Each issue, I will be highlighting a few of our articles that I think are important. This article by Dr. Nael and colleagues from Mount Sinai Icon School of Medicine, the University of Cincinnati Medical Center, and the University of Manitoba reviews how imaging can be used for endovascular treatment selection of acute ischemic stroke in the context of recently published American Heart Association and American Stroke Association guidelines. After a brief review of the published guidelines, the authors review multimodal CT, including non-contrast examination to determine extent of ischemia and exclude intracranial hemorrhage, CT angiography for assessing large vessel occlusion, and CT perfusion to assess ischemic core and penumbra. The major advantage of MR in this setting is the DWI sequence for assessment of early ischemia. Similar to CTA, MRA can assess for large vessel occlusion, and MR perfusion assesses the penumbra. MR is, however, limited by availability and scan times required and should only be used at institutions that can achieve similar speed and efficiency to CT. Collateral flow status information helps assess the size of the ischemic core and predict outcomes and can be assessed by either CTA, MRA, or MR perfusion. The authors stress the importance for stroke centers to develop and maintain a consistent and efficient imaging workflow for assessing patients. The article then delves into the imaging-based treatment selection, dividing time windows into early, less than six hours, and late, six to 24 hours. Patient subgroups that were excluded from recent endovascular therapy trials because of limited evidence of efficacy of endovascular therapy are then addressed. These include patients with a low NIHSS or NIH stroke scale, distal occlusions such as M3 and anterior cerebral artery occlusions, a large ischemic score defined as having an ASPEX, which is the Alberta Stroke Program Early Computed Tomography Score of less than six, or ischemic core volumes between 50 and 70 ml, posterior circulation large vessel occlusion, and large vessel occlusion beyond 24 hours. For all of these groups, data is limited, and this precludes definitive recommendations, although the authors review recent reports that, if confirmed, should help guide management of these groups. The paper concludes by confirming that advanced imaging plays a critical role in the selection of patients with acute ischemic stroke providing evidence from current guidelines for patients presenting in the early time window and stressing the importance of perfusion imaging for those evaluated in the late 6 to 24 hour time window. In this review article from leading U.S. and Canadian institutions, Dr. Christopher Potter and authors review the CT-based workup of ischemic stroke patients for making IV, TPA, and endovascular therapy decisions, focusing on practical skills, interpretation challenges, mimics, and pitfalls. Following an introduction that reviews some of the trial results discussed in the article by Dr. Nael and colleagues on endovascular therapy for acute ischemic stroke, the article begins with a brief review of the concepts of ischemic core and penumbra that are essential to understanding the pathophysiology underlying the CT findings encountered. In determining the eligibility for treatment, the radiologist must rapidly answer the following three essential questions. First, on non-contrast CT, is there hemorrhage that would contraindicate IV TPA or endovascular therapy? And is there a large, well-established hypodense infarct? Two, on CT angiography, is there a proximal large vessel occlusion as a target for endovascular therapy? And three, on DWI, CTA, or CT perfusion, 
Is there a large core infarct that is a relative contraindication to IV TPA or endovascular therapy? First, a non-contrast head CT should include contiguous or overlapping reconstructed axial slices of less than or equal to 5 millimeters. Current American Heart Association guidelines recommend non-contrast CT within 25 minutes of arrival for greater than 50% of potential stroke candidates. The authors point out that several areas of the brain, including the insula, basal ganglia, and caudate head, are early indicators of acute infarct owing to their vascular anatomy in relation to the most common patterns of proximal MCA large vessel occlusion distribution and special attention should therefore be directed to these regions during initial image review. After a review of the Alberta Stroke Program Early CT Score, or ASPECTS system, for estimating the size of ischemic change, the authors provide a series of interpretation tips, including evaluation of gray-white differentiation and of the sulci and vessels. Pitfalls are mostly related to artifacts from patient motion or from the bony skull base. The acquisition technique for CTA of the head and neck is reviewed, again followed by tips for CTA image review, including identifying large vessel occlusion and the presence of collateral flow. There are many pitfalls in CTA interpretation. Importantly, late phase CTA with extensive venous opacification can render interpretation challenging. For CT perfusion, the acquisition technique and post-processing of the CT perfusion data are key to generating perfusion maps. Cerebral blood flow and time to maximum enhancement are the most accurate for acute stroke evaluation. Again, the authors provide tips or pearls for image review and describe the pitfalls of CT perfusion, including motion artifact, poor signal-to-noise ratio from suboptimal contrast bolus, faulty arterial and venous input functions, and truncation of the tissue and vascular time density flow curves from too short of an acquisition. The final section of the article describes some stroke mimics, including intracranial mass, cerebritis and cerebral abscess, and posterior reversible encephalopathy, among others. In this monograph article on the imaging evaluation of acute headache presenting emergently, Dr. Malika Guril Yildirim and colleagues from Rush University Medical Center in Chicago, Illinois, introduced the topic by reviewing the statistics surrounding this common presenting complaint and discussing the appropriateness of imaging in specific clinical settings. This is followed by a discussion of imaging modalities to be utilized. This begins with unenhanced CT to look for hemorrhage, edema, or mass effect. If subarachnoid hemorrhage is confirmed on subsequent lumbar puncture in patients with negative CT scans, CTA, MRA, or catheter angiography is employed, with CTA most commonly used. In patients with new headache and a history of immunosuppression or cancer, MR is often performed for initial imaging. MR venography is employed if dural venous sinus thrombosis is suspected. The article then delves into the specific etiologies of acute headache, beginning with those presenting as predominantly hemorrhage. Non-traumatic subarachnoid hemorrhage is reviewed, followed by mycotic aneurysm, non-aneurysmal perimesencephalic subarachnoid hemorrhage, and various causes of intracerebral hemorrhage, including hypertension, cerebral amyloid angiopathy, arteriovenous malformations, and dural AV fistulas. Spontaneous retroclival hematoma is most often seen as a result of trauma in children. Figure 7 shows a typical example. Pathologies manifesting as vascular abnormalities include reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, or PRES, cerebral venous thrombosis, which is the subject of an article by Canedo and Tello and colleagues in the same monograph issue, and carotid and vertebral artery dissection. Diseases manifesting as edema or with mass effect are reviewed next. 
This section begins with intracranial infections in normal hosts and those with HIV infection, and primary neoplasms and metastatic disease. The final section discusses miscellaneous entities that produce intracranial pressure changes and toxic and metabolic conditions. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension is no longer termed benign, as it can produce vision loss and reduced quality of life. Spontaneous intracranial hypotension is an important cause of new persistent daily headache. Imaging features of this condition include sagging of the brain, which can be misinterpreted as a Chiari malformation, subdural fluid collections, diffuse pachymeningeal enhancement, and pituitary gland hyperemia, as shown in figure 19. Postdural puncture headache is a re related condition due to low CSF pressure and occurs within five days of a lumbar puncture. The mechanisms for this complication are either intrathecal air or CSF leak. Those due to air present within hours of an LP, whereas headache from CSF leak is typically delayed in onset. Pituitary apoplexy is a severe and potentially fatal medical condition. Hemorrhagic infarction of a pituitary macroadenoma and less commonly pituitary necrosis following massive postpartum bleeding or Sheehan syndrome are the most common etiologies. Finally, carbon monoxide poisoning should be considered in patients presenting to the emergency room with headache during the winter months, particularly when other family members or coworkers from a common enclosed space are affected. MR findings in the globus pallidi are strikingly illustrated in figure 22. Life-threatening blunt and penetrating injuries to the neck and skull base, although uncommon, require prompt recognition and management to avoid devastating outcomes. Multi-detector row CT, with CT angiography when vascular lesions are suspected, has become the mainstay of urgent imaging evaluation. The radiologist plays a key role in assessing critical structures, including the one airway, two common and internal carotid arteries, three pharynx, four esophagus, five temporal bone, and six vagus and facial nerves. Airway compromise may result from laryngotracheal injury. Vascular injury can result in dissection, occlusion, pseudoaneurysm formation, or frank extravasation. Injuries to the pharynx and esophagus can result in perforation. And injuries to the temporal bone can cause vascular injury to the internal carotid artery or facial nerve, which may require immediate surgery to prevent paralysis. In this paper, John Goh and colleagues from USC review the pertinent anatomy and classification schemes that the radiologist should be familiar with when encountering traumatic emergencies of the neck and skull base, and describe key findings that should be reported that may require time-sensitive, acute surgical, or endovascular treatment. The neck is divided into three ascending zones for classification purposes. Zone one from the sternal notch to the cricoid cartilage, zone two from the cricoid to the angle of the mandible, and zone three from the angle of the mandible to the skull base. Critical findings that necessitate additional evaluation include both fractures directly through arterial or venous vascular channels, which should prompt CTA assessment, as well as air where it shouldn't be, suggesting perforation of the larynx, pharynx, or esophagus, which requires localization and subspecialty consultation for management. Hemorrhage and edema following neck trauma can progress to airway compromise, which at minimum typically requires observation with careful monitoring. To maximize detection of fractures, air, and hematoma, CT images should always be post-processed and reviewed in bone, lung, and soft tissue windows. Fractures or displacement of the retinoid, cricoid, thyroid, or tracheal cartilages, which may be harder to detect than fractures of ossified bony structures, must be looked for and reported. The differential diagnosis of hemorrhagic edematous lesions with punctate air includes abscess, packing material, and tumor. 
In summary, neck and skull-based traumatic emergencies require a combination of familiarity with key anatomy and imaging knowledge for the radiologist to appropriately describe, diagnose, and classify injuries. CT and CTA is the modality of choice for both blunt and penetrating trauma to detect and characterize cervical vascular, laryngotracheal, pharyngoesophageal, and temporal skull base injuries. Detailed assessment and reporting of critical findings allows the radiologist to communicate the information required to determine appropriate time-sensitive surgery, endovascular care, and follow-up. Myelopathy refers to the clinical syndrome related to spinal cord injury that can include motor, sensory, bowel, and bladder dysfunction. Intramedullary spinal cord signal hyperintensity on T2-weighted MR is the most common imaging indicator of spinal cord pathology, but is nonspecific. Radiologists play an essential role in helping to narrow the differential diagnosis by integrating the historical and laboratory clinical findings with the key imaging characteristics. In this paper, Lee and colleagues from the University of Michigan present an algorithmic approach to evaluating intrinsic spinal cord signal abnormality, which incorporates clinical evaluation, time of onset, in other words, acute versus non-acute, cord expansion, and the pattern of T2 signal abnormality. Their practical, systematic approach has the potential to help radiologists, regardless of level of training, in the workup of myelopathy. T2 bright spinal cord signal can 1. involve gray matter, white matter, or both, 2. can reflect a large range of pathological processes, including reversible edema from blood spinal cord barrier breakdown associated with ischemia or injury, irreversible acute cord infarct, subacute myelomalacia, or chronic cavitation, and 3. has a broad differential diagnosis, including metabolic and demyelinating lesions. Although one of the most common causes of T2 hyperintense cord signal is extrinsic compression from vertebral body or disc traumatic or degenerative injury, because such findings are obvious on imaging and do not pose a diagnostic dilemma, the focus of this paper is on intrinsic causes of myelopathy. According to the algorithmic approach outlined in figure one of the manuscript, the first step in image interpretation is to exclude artifact. Gibbs artifact, for example, alternating bright and dark linear signal along the long axis of the cord and spinal canal, also known as truncation or ring down artifact, can mimic syrinx or hydromyelia. Next, in the absence of compression, knowing the acuity of onset, did the symptoms develop over minutes, hours, days, weeks, or months, can help distinguish vascular from infectious, from inflammatory, from metabolic, from neurodegenerative causes of myelopathy. Age, gender, immune or HIV status, and intravenous drug use are all important considerations in narrowing the differential diagnosis. Regarding imaging findings, is the lesion expansile or non-expansile? Expansion, especially focal expansion, can be a specific, although relatively insensitive, marker for a neoplasm. The anatomic distribution of T2 hyperintense spinal cord lesions, as per figure four of the manuscript, can also be useful for distinguishing different subtypes of demyelinating lesions, among these multiple sclerosis, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, neuromyelitis optica, and transverse myelitis. MS lesions, for example, are typically short, less than one and a half vertebral body segments long in craniocaudal extent, and affect less than half the cross-sectional area of the cord. In summary, an algorithmic diagnostic approach to evaluating T2 signal hyperintensity within the spinal cord may help radiologists to narrow the differential diagnosis in patients with myelopathy.
Over the past two decades, the number of annual spine surgeries has been steadily increasing, accompanied by a growing number of postoperative imaging studies. CT is accurate for identifying the location and integrity of implants, success of decompression and intervertebral arthrodesis, and detecting and characterizing complications. While CT of the postoperative spine is often limited by artifacts that arise from metallic implants, parameter optimization and advanced metal artifact reduction techniques, including iterative reconstruction and monoenergetic extrapolation, reduce metal artifacts and can substantially improve image quality. Well-established and new generation spinal implants and prostheses include screws and wires, static and extendable rods, bone grafts and biologicals, interbody cages, and intervertebral disc prostheses. The checklist for CT assessment of the spectrum of complications following spinal surgery, instrumentation, and intervertebral arthroplasty includes one, position and integrity of implants and prostheses, two, adjacent segment degeneration, three, collections, four, fistulas, five, pseudomeningocele and cerebrospinal fluid leaks, and six, surgical site infection. Knowledge of the surgical techniques, approaches, and devices aids in the differentiation of expected post-treatment findings from complications. In this paper, Gaudassara and colleagues from Johns Hopkins Hospital review various surgical spinal instrumentation techniques and describe commonly used spinal implants. They also illustrate normal postoperative findings, signs of successful surgery, and a broad spectrum of postoperative complications. The main types of spine surgery include decompression, fixation, stabilization and fusion, correction of deformity, as well as excision and debridement of lesions. Decompression is mainly performed to minimize mass effects through the removal of herniated disc material or to relieve spinal and neuroforaminal stenosis. This can be achieved by performing a laminotomy, sequestrectomy, and optional nucellotomy if the annulus defect is surgically accessible. Stabilization with the intent to achieve osseous spinal fusion is performed when there is suspected or proven instability due to degenerative disc disease, spondylolysis with spondylolisthesis, trauma, infection, and malignancy. In this setting, the goals of spinal implants are to immobilize the motion segment to allow for osseous fusion to occur, maintain or restore alignment, and to create the ability to adequately handle the biomechanical forces after removal of a portion of the spine. Spinal fixation can be accomplished using a variety of implants. While there are many different instrumentation systems, devices, and individualized constructs, the most commonly used include screws and wires, plates, rods, bone grafts, and other biologics, interbody cages, and intervertebral disc replacements. In summary, CT is accurate for identifying the location and integrity of implants, periimplant osteolysis, fractures, and adjacent segment disease. Although CT can detect collections and often diagnose abscesses, however, myelography and MRI are often needed for full characterization and diagnosis of fistulas, pseudomeningoceles, and surgical site infection. Familiarity with these topics can aid radiologists in generating reports that address what the referring surgeon needs to know for optimal patient management. Dental pathology, a common incidental finding on emergency CT scans, can be a diagnostic challenge for radiologists without extensive experience in head and neck imaging. There has also been a rise in ED visits over the past decade for primary dental problems, typically with chief complaints of pain, trauma, or infection. Because dental abnormalities can be subtle, 
their frequent association with craniofacial trauma, sinus infection, and maxillomandibular procedures necessitates a practiced, systematic approach for their interpretation. In this paper, Dr. Lorero and colleagues from the Hospital Israelita Albert Einstein in Sao Paulo, Brazil, review and categorize the imaging findings of dental emergencies. They discuss the relevant vocabulary, protocols, and anatomy of the teeth and related structures, as well as key features of dental infections, trauma, and procedural complications. Given the topic of emergency imaging, their focus is exclusively on CT rather than plain film, panorex, or ultrasound. Methods to improve CT soft tissue assessment are highlighted, including both the one puffed cheek maneuver, which is distending the oral cavity to separate the gingival and buccal surfaces, facilitating better visualization, localization, and delineation of mucosal lesions, such as small abscesses, and two, minimization of metallic artifact by acquiring CT images in both closed and open mouth positions, thus moving any source of metal artifacts to a different area in the second acquisition. Metal artifact reduction software, however available from some CT vendors, is not discussed. Thin slice reconstructions allow for not only axial, sagittal, and coronal multiplane reformats, but also 3D volume rendered in panorex projections. Teeth are attached in bone sockets called alveolar processes by periodontal ligaments that allow slight mobility during chewing. The visible portion of the tooth is called the crown, whereas the portion covered by the alveolar ridge is called the root. The crown is composed of two mineralized layers, one external harder layer called enamel and a deeper layer called dentin. An additional inner structure, also known as pulp, contains the neurovascular elements. The dentin and pulp extend apically to form the root, which is surrounded by a thin third mineralized layer called cementum. This basic tooth anatomy is well illustrated in figure two of the manuscript. The transition between the outermost layer of enamel and cementum marks the boundary between crown and root and is named the cemento-enamel junction or neck. The teeth can be numbered by two major classification systems, the universal system and the World Dental Federation system. The universal system is most commonly used in the United States. In this system, the maxillary right, maxillary left, mandibular left, and mandibular right quadrants are arranged in a circle in the clockwise direction. This system identifies the primary teeth, known as the deciduous or childhood teeth, with letters in alphabetical order, progressing from A to T clockwise, and the permanent teeth with the numbers from 1 to 32 also clockwise. The division between the sublingual and submandibular spaces by the myohyoid muscle, which forms a sling across the base of the mandible and is essential to understanding the spread of dental infections, is also highlighted. Thank you for listening. I hope you found these summaries helpful. Please subscribe to our podcasts and rate us on iTunes. This helps your colleagues find us much more easily. We greatly appreciate it.